Two important things to note, there'll be time for questions at the end. Please write all questions in the question box of the GoToWebinar control panel. Additionally, the presentation will be available in the handouts box as a PDF. Welcome to our presentation on the Hunter Harrison Memorial Bridge, a new pedestrian cable state bridge at the University of Memphis. My name is Stephen Lowinger. And my name is Dennis Smith, and we have both been structural engineers at WSP for the past five years. This is the agenda for today's talk. We'll first discuss an introduction, the need for the bridge, and the involvement with the architect. We'll discuss an overview of the main structural elements, those being the tower and the deck, and then wrap up with a conclusion and a question and answer time. The bridge is located in the state of Tennessee. More specifically, is located in the city of Memphis at the University of Memphis. Here's a map of the campus, and as you can see outlined, the campus is divided into a north and south portion of the campus, which is, celebrates, which is separated by freight railroad tracks. The majority of the university buildings are located on the north side, with a few buildings as well as student parking located in the south. Zooming into the crossing of the tracks, we can see that there are three at-grade crossings existing. However, the trains were often mile-long freight trains and took a long time to clear the crossings, and at time would stop in the tracks, completely blocking the crossing, isolating the north and south campus. This would often cause students to be late for class or be forced to dangerously climb through stop trains to get to class. To address these issues, the university proposed to build a new pedestrian bridge over the tracks <clears throat> that would both improve pedestrian safety and also serve as a connection between the main North Campus and the newly developing South Campus. Additionally, the university had to put out an updated master plan, which included adding more facilities to the South portion of campus, including recreational facilities and a new parking structure. Therefore, for these two reasons, the university needed to create a better way to cross the tracks and provide for a more unified campus. In order to do this, the university wanted to create not only a bridge, but an iconic structure that looks like this. Seen here is a 3D rendering of the campus. The bridge is shown on the left. It is a single tower cable stayed bridge. The south side of the campus is shown on the left side of the image. From that side, the bridge can be accessed from the ground as well as directly from the new parking structure adjacent to the bridge. On the right side of the image is the north side. From that side, the bridge is, can be accessed via a grand entrance structure called the promenade. The new bridge would serve to do much more than simply connect the North and South Campus, but it would improve the connectivity of the entire campus. Before the construction, the, the university president had said that it would prove to be the single most transformational structure ever constructed by University of Memphis. In this photo, you can see the final product, which was completed in August 2019. The bridge is lit in the official school color of University Blue, which highlights the main structural features, including the tower, the cables, and the deck. There is a wire mesh fence that provides views of the campus and the city beyond. The fence's sweeping profile rises gracefully to a height of 2.4 meters as it crosses over the railroad. This is just one example of how safety is at the forefront throughout the design and the construction. The bridge also meets four of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is a much safer and more reliable alternative to the existing crossing. It increases student well-being and improves their access to quality education. Education is fundamental to reduce the economic inequalities, and the bridge accommodates equitable transportation as a walkable, bikeable, and ADA accessible crossing. All the above combined with the resilient structure of the bridge itself to promote a sustainable city and community. The project was delivered via design bid build. The owner, the owner was the Tennessee Board of Regents who oversee the state university system. They contracted directly with the architect Hayslip Studios as the prime consultant who then selected WSP USA as a structural engineer for the Cable State Bridge and selected Burr and Cole to design the adjacent structures, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Subsequently, Hazlip selected Flint Co. as the general contractor. In addition to WSP's role as the designer of the Cable State Bridge, we also had a role during the construction, providing construction support services, answering RFIs, as well as reviewing submittals. A breakdown of the different structures can be seen in the next slide. As Stephen mentioned, our bridge uh, was part of a series of structures within a larger project. Um, here in blue, you can see the main span, which was designed by WSP, and which crosses over the railroad and Southern Ave. 
in red on the right is the land bridge, which crosses over Walker Drive. And in red on the left is the colonnade structure, which overlooks the new pedestrian plaza and connects directly to the third level of the new parking garage. And so both of those in red were designed by our co-consultants, Burr and Cole. Because these adjacent structures were being built at the same time as our structure, there was a great deal of coordination required. And to facilitate this, we made our bridge as structurally self-contained as possible, which along with other constraints uh, led to some unique and innovative structural features, like the one in the photo in the top right. Um, here you can see the deck gets wider and thicker as it nears the tower. And this allows the transfer of horizontal loads from the deck into the tower instead of being transferred through to the colonnade which is further to the right in this photo. Um, so please keep that in mind as we jump into the design overview. This elevation view uh, shows the main structural and environmental elements to give you some idea of the flow of forces. Um, so vertically, the pedestrian loads are carried by the concrete slab onto the steel edge girders. And note here the location of the girder splice and the temporary pier, which we will come back to later in the deck section. Um, from the girders, the forces are carried up the main cables, the top of the tower, and then down through the backstay and the tower into the foundations. So that resolves the vertical forces, um, but there are also some significant horizontal forces in play. Uh, in many cable stay bridges, the deck would continue through the tower and the horizontal forces would simply resolve in the deck itself. Um, but since, as we mentioned, we we're trying to keep our structure self-contained, um, the compression in the deck is instead transferred into the tower. And then the unbalanced horizontal force that's now in the backstay cable um, is carried through <clears throat> a grade beam which connects the backstay anchorage and the tower pile cap. Now I'll give a rundown of the key dimensions uh, to give you some sense of scale. So the main span is 47.5 meters long and the deck is 4.8 meters wide. The <clears throat> two edge girders are 90 centimeters deep. The cables are arranged in an asymmetrical semi-fan formation with five main band cables per plane at 7.6 meter spacing along the deck and two backstay cables per plane. The concrete slab is 203 millimeters thick and the mostly concrete tower is 32.3 meters tall, composed of two pylons with inclined tapered profiles, which narrow from 3.2 meters wide at the bottom 2.9 meters wide at the top. And no, I said mostly concrete um, because the top nine meters of the tower are encased in a specially designed welded steel box. So with that, let's take a closer look at the design of the tower. So as I just mentioned, and as shown on the tower key to the right, the top nine meters of the tower are formed by a welded steel box, while the rest is constructed in normal reinforced concrete. Um, and in this horizontal section, you can see that the box houses cable anchorages, as well as in the photo, you can see also anchors a X-shaped cross bracing. Um, and so these two features would not have been possible um, with such a narrow section, which is what led WSP to create this uniquely designed uh, box. So after being lifted into place, the box is filled with concrete, which then engages the studs shown in the section uh, for composite action. Um, but before the concrete cures, there is a risk of overturning for this inclined uh, tower. So we added post tensioning bars, which tie the box back into the concrete in the lower portion of the tower. And you can see those uh, post tensioning bars as the darker dots. Um, so now on the next slide, you'll see a vertical section um, which shows some more of those 
uh, features, the PT bars, the cross bracing anchorage, the cable anchorages, uh, and the studs. And then on the right, you can see um, the box being lifted into place. Uh, the, there's some rebar continuing up from the concrete portion of the tower through into the box. Um, all right, so now we'll look at the lower portion of the tower. And here, uh, there were some, a couple of challenges uh, impacting the reinforcement. Um, some of those were architectural requirements, like the inclined and tapering profile, uh, which meant that every horizont horizontal section is different. Um, there's also the very narrow section. It's only 61 centimeters or two feet thick, uh, which gave us very limited clearance all around. Uh, there were also zones where we had to design for plastic effects. Uh, one of those was at the deck level because of the moment coming in uh, from the horizontal force in the deck. And another one was at the foundation level because of seismic requirements, um, which also meant we needed to use hoops and a tighter spacing between layers. So that all adds up to, uh, we had to fit a lot of rebar into a very small space and do so in a way that was actually constructible. So in the face of these challenges, WSP delivered an innovative yet simple solution uh, using just two different hoop sizes, which alternate and overlap as the section narrows up the tapered tower. Here's a quick peek of the section view at the base of the tower. And you can see it's quite congested, uh, but working closely with the contractor, we, will, we were able to bring the architect's vision to life for the tower. Um, Moving back to the top of the tower, we're gonna to take a quick look at the cables. Um, so looking at the back stays, we have four seven strand cables in total uh, with two per pylon. Uh, the dead end of the back stays is at a fin plate, which comes off of the back of the steel box. Um, the back stays are then stressed at ground level and especially designed anchor block. You can see this finished grade is actually right in the middle of the new pedestrian plaza. And so we had to add uh, some security features to these anchor blocks, including an access panel door um, to allow for the stressing of the cables, as well as anti-vandal pipes around the cables coming out of the top. Um, and those are also treated with anti-climb paint to prevent any shenanigans. And then looking at the mainstay cables, um, we have uh, 10 five-strand cables in total with five per pylon. Um, and these are stress of the tower, which meant we had to leave the back of the welded steel box open and then cover it with a specially designed cover plate once uh, the stressing was completed. And then the, deck, the dead end for the mainstay cables is at deck level um, where the connection plates are welded to the flanges and web of the edge girders. And so that brings us to the design of the deck. There are two composite edge girders, which are rolled W30 by 291 beams that run parallel to the plane of the cables. They're supported by the cables approximately every 7.6 meters. At each point of the connection with the cables, there's a floor beam that spans between these edge girders. The girders were erected in two segments with a field splice being made adjacent to the temporary construction support shown in blue. This was located outside of the 7.6 meter clearance envelope of the railroad. By having this temporary support, we were able to avoid working over the railroad and minimize the number of track outages. The girders directly support a slab which is 203 millimeters thick, but is, is composed of a hybrid system. One concern of the client was working over the railroad tracks and the potential impact to schedule if it was required to foul the tracks throughout the construction. In order to mitigate this issue, WSP designed a deck to be constructed with the bottom 114 millimeters as a precast panel and the top 89 millimeters as cast to place concrete. In order to ensure composite behavior between these two slab components, the top of the precast panel was roughened and there were hoops installed in the precast panel to engage the cast in place concrete. A major benefit of this hybrid deck system was that it minimized the interference with the train traffic as we avoided installing formwork over the tracks because the precast portion of the deck itself acted as the formwork. 
This enabled a safer working environment and also allowed for less track outages. This also allows for the bottom of the deck to be visible for inspections in the future. Another important consideration in design of the deck was accounting for vibrations. The design of our structure resulted in a redundant but slender and flexible structure. Due to the flexibility, the bridge had a low frequency of the first vertical mode of 1.37 Hertz. ASHTO, which for our international audience is an acronym for the American Association of Highway and Transportation Officials, LRFD guide specifications for the design of pedestrian bridges, states that if the frequency of the first vertical mode is less than three hertz, then further investigation is required. Therefore, further investigation was conducted in accordance with the technical guide for the assessment of vibration, vibrational behavior of footbridges under pedestrian loading, which is a French code called CETRA. The vertical frequency of the bridge was therefore checked, and the bridge was categorized under range three for minimum comfort, and is therefore acceptable. This means the accelerations undergone by the structure are perceived by the users, but do not become intolerable. Another concern in the design of pedestrian bridges is the potential for the pedestrian lock-in phenomenon. This occurs when a bridge begins to sway laterally and pedestrians modify their gait to maintain stability. If the bridge has a low degree of damping, this reaction can lead to larger vibrations. This phenomenon was also investigated as the lateral motor of the tower has a frequency of 1.22 hertz, which is less than the recommended minimum 1.3 hertz stated in ASHTO. After evaluating the, after evaluating the dynamic performance of the structure using Cetra, the, we concluded the lock-in phenomenon would not be a concern. As demonstrated, ensuring a positive pedestrian experience was a major aspect considered in the design, ranging from providing a safe crossing over the train tracks to providing a bridge that enabled the pedestrian comfort as well. This includes the design portion of our presentation, and now we wrap up with a conclusion. We discussed the geography and need for the bridge. We discussed the collaboration with the architect and ensuring the architect's vision became a reality, as well as the innovative designs of the major components of the bridge provided by WSP. The bridge opened in August 2019 with great celebration which included the president of the university, as well as a small marching band, as can be shown in the photo here. It has filled a much awaited campus need providing a safe and efficient crossing over the railroad and has now enabled the development of the south end of campus. The bridge has been open for over two years and has been well received by all. It will stand for years to come and demonstrate the spirit of growth of the University of Memphis. Thank you so much for listening. And we will now answer any questions. Thank you, Tim, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, so before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your question in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also the PDF of the presentation is available to download in the dashboard, in the handout box. I will start with the first question. What was the total cost of the project? Sure, yeah, I'll take this one. So. We don't have an exact number for the pedestrian bridge, but the overall project included the construction of the, the pedestrian bridge, the two adjacent structures, and that parking garage adjacent on the south side of the bridge. And all the construction, the construction cost of all of that was $34 million. Thank you. Uh, the next question, is a cable state bridge uh, the most cost-effective solution or does it, its aesthetic make it more appealing a uh, choice? Yes, a uh, valid question. So we were brought on once the structure type was decided. Uh, the structure type was decided between the architect, Hay the architect Hayslip Studios and the Tennessee Board of Regents. And I think because it was on university campus and they wanted to make it an iconic structure, uh, they decided to go with a, a bridge type that was more architecturally appealing. Um, a cable state bridge probably wasn't necessary, but it definitely does uh, fulfill the uh, idea of having an iconic structure on the campus. Thank you. What reference codes were used for the project? Uh, is it ASHTO pedestrian, AWS, D1.5 D or D1.1? Yeah, um, so we did mention uh, ASHTO pedestrian on the slides, um, as well as the general ASHTO <coughs> LRFD for bridges, um, and Cetra, the European code. Um, for the AWS, um, which is the American Welding Society, um, we use D1.5, which is the uh, bridge-specific welding code. 
Thank you. How is the connection between the steel box and the con concrete tower? Can you please elaborate on this? Yeah. So the connection between the steel box and the concrete tower is achieved um, through a combination of uh, reinforcement, which continues from the lower portion of the tower into the um, concrete box, which uh, is filled with concrete as well. Um, and then that concrete, the concrete in the tower um, is composite with the box, the steel of the box itself, because you have studs in there. And then there's also the pre-stressing bars, which were um, included for the construction load, but which remain after construction as well, um, that continue from the lower concrete portion into the box. Thank you. Uh, did you perform global stability analysis for the pylons? Uh, yes, that was conducted. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here about uh, the risk of ice falling from the cables during winter. Uh, was it considered? And if so, if it, was it mitigated? Yeah, I don't think uh, Memphis is pretty hot. Um, I don't know how much ice they get, but that was not uh, considered in this design. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, could you talk more uh, in details about the design of the foundations? Sure. Uh, yeah, the foundation uh, elements were three foot diameter drill shafts. They were eight uh, drill shafts under the tower, and they were four under the backs to anchorage foundation. And then, the, like Daniel mentioned earlier, the load was transferred between the foundations via that grade beam. Thank you. Sorry, lots of questions are coming through. <laughs> um, the next question is, uh, was was it the design of the bridge and the cable res respectively? Did you consider the cable change in the future uh, pair at the same time? Repeat that question in a second. Uh, the, the question is, is about the design of the bridge and the cable. Uh, did you consider the cable change in the future? and uh, potentially repair at the same time? Uh, yes, that was considered as one of the uh, load cases. We did cable replacement and cable loss. Thank you. Uh, could you elaborate on how the stability analysis was performed? Um, I would say, uh, let me respond to you post this uh, presentation to give you a more detailed uh, discussion. Definitely, thank you. Uh, the next question is, was, is what is the reinforcement ratio in the tower? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. um, so the uh, reinforcement ratio for the longitudinal uh, rebar alone was 3.6%, uh, which is just under the typical limit of 4%. Um, but if you include uh, all the transverse rebar as well, um, it goes up to just under uh, 7%, so quite dense with rebar. Thank you. What measures of safety were implemented on the two left cables that support the tower? Uh, there are a few questions here in the same uh, comment. Um, was there any blast resistant measures as well? I will let you answer this first. So uh, what measures of safety were implemented on the two uh, left cables that support the tower? Yeah, so the um, the measures that we went through on the slides are most of it, um, or most of the safety that was incorporated, um, mostly concerned with uh, just keeping people from uh, climbing over the cables and such. Um, nothing specific for blast resistant uh, although the anti-vandalism cables do provide a bit of standoff. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, did you consider post-tensioning uh, the tower on the same side of the cables for added safety? No. There, I and mean, there's the, the post-tensioning bars in the steel box. Uh, we're mostly there for the construction loads, but in terms of the um, sort of service loads and stuff, the 
we're mainly relying on the uh, backstay cables to resist the mainstay forces. Thank you. There's a question here about the design service life. Um, what is uh, the design here? Uh, how many years is it? Uh, we went with the typical 100 year service life. Okay, uh, another question here. Uh, were the cable stainless? Uh, I, I, I guess they, they speak about the paint? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, they're in, I think they're just galvanized um, and they're in uh, tubes, um, HGP tubes. So, um, yeah, they're not like exposed. Thank you. Did a peer review done on this design? No. Thank you. Um, another question, how were the cables stressed? Yeah, so uh, we did actually have a somewhat detailed uh, process for that, uh, working closely with the contractor. Um, so we had a, a finite element model built, which um, modeled each stage of the cable stressing operation, uh, starting with the backstay cables and then the mainstay cable closest to the tower and then moving away from the tower out to the longest cable. Um, actually, because it was so long, it had to be sort of stressed in two stages. Um, to get the uh, to make sure all the force was in there that needed to be, um, and so we provided the contractor with um, sort of target uh, survey points for each endpoint of the the cables. So as they're stressing the cables, they're taking surveys of those endpoints uh, to make sure that they are uh, sort of close enough to what we had modeled. Um, and yeah, and we were we were checking in with them at each stage and, and it was uh, we were successful in achieving the correct deck profile and uh, cable stresses. Thank you. I will take the last question. Uh, any consideration to prevent students from attaching locks to the bridge? <laughs> Very trendy. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> No. Uh, okay. No, but if any students are listening, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, fantastic. Um, thank you, audience, the audience, for the fantastic uh, questions that were sent. Um, so we are at the end of our webinar session. Please feel free to follow up directly with Denise and Stephen via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank everyone for joining today. Thank you for your time and thank you, uh, team, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Sharon, for uh, organizing all this and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you.